Hey, greetings, folks. Welcome to another uh, broadcast, podcast, YouTube cast, cast, cast of Adventures of Perfect Living. I'm Greg Willits from RosaryArmy.com. And I'm Jennifer Willits, his wife. You know, there's a lot of books that we talk about on the program uh, written by modern day authors. And one of the things that we don't always do is have the original saint on the show to talk about it. So today we're going to be talking with St. Francis de Sales. <laughs> it's coming down from heaven to hang out with us as we talk about <laughs> Introduction to the Devout Life. Uh, no, this is actually a book that I I remember the first time this book came came my way is right after Rosary Army started, mm-hmm. right before uh, we were going to be at the Eucharist of Congress in Atlanta for the first time. So that would have been back in 2003 when Rosary Army wow. had their first table there. And there was this family that lived in a log cabin that went to our parish, and they moved shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. But a bunch of us went over to their house, and you probably don't remember this family at all, do you? They lived really close to us. And we like, I don't know how. And Conyers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, super nice couple. Mm-hmm. And I could even probably drive you to their house. But the guy mentioned this book. He goes, oh, you got to read that book. And so I immediately went to the, the monastery near us that had a Catholic bookstore. Mm-hmm. And I bought it and I and I underlined the heck out of it. And I even like, you know, have pages that fell out, um, carried it with me for the longest time. Admittedly, though, never finished it. You look at the second half, there's nothing... There's no highlights. There's nothing written. But when I go through it, I just see all these lines of that just... It was speaking to you <clears throat> even then. Well, it, the the sad thing is, is I see the things that I underline. I'm like, I didn't learn my lesson at all mm. <laughs> because these are still things that I am I am trying to 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 learn. And so that's why I was really glad when, uh, you know, every few weeks I get an email from various publishers and they're like, hey, we got these books coming out. Do you want to have these guests on the show? And we try to be super selective because there's number one, there's more books and authors that we could that we could mm-hmm. focus. When we did the daily radio show, it's like, yeah, send us everything. Um, but now it's like, you know, we can we can be selective. It's like, what do we want to focus on? But because the introduction to the devout life is something that's always been important to me, um, it's something that we even named our our son France. You know, his middle name is Francis after Saint Francis de Sales. Um, our son Tommy. <clears throat> Named him after this guy. He's the patron saint of writers. And so, you know, I've always had a, a, an appreciation of him. So when I found out about this new book from Deacon Matthew Newsom, he wrote The Devout Life, A Modern Guide to Practical Holiness with St. Francis of Sales. At first I was like, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't want a modernization of it. I want the, the original, the original writing. But seeing how he was able, to, he is able to bring it to life in a way that makes the incredibly important work of St. Francis de Sales more attractive to modern eyes and ears, right? To bring it to a greater understanding and implementation in our lives, it made a lot of sense for us to have him on the program and even to the point of just like, just because I I do believe that the introduction to the devout life is something that I need to revisit my own life. I truly honestly do, but I keep procrastinating doing it. And this book, I feel like, is and we say this when we're talking to uh, Deacon Matt, it's it's truly something that I think is it, well, it's been an impetus for me. Yeah, and and I think <clears throat> part of the problem is is we are guardians of our energy, and if we sense that that book, that writing, that essay, whoever wrote it, is going to suck out energy that I don't have, then we simply don't move toward the thing that we know that we should because we are. I think naturally drawn to protecting our energy, but I think that's precisely when you should do it. Uh, that's <clears throat> that's the fight. And is when, to do what you should. And when God, God God oftentimes sends people and sends resources and sends podcasts and videos your way, right? If you're clicking on this and watching it, it probably is the time that you need to hear this. And so we're really excited. This is the first time we ever had a chance to to virtually meet uh, Deacon Matthew Newsom. He is a uh, campus minister. For a college in North Carolina, he's the father of seven. Uh, he's the husband of one. He, that was in his bio. Husband oh. of one, father of seven. <laughs> he's got sheep and he likes to drink coffee. I'm like, this is a great guy. Oh it yeah, is, we and, didn't even. Oh. And he wrote a book about <laughs> St. Francis of Sales. We're going to be speaking right now with Deacon Matthew Newsom. His new book, The Devout Life. It is a modern guide to practical holiness with St. Francis de Sales. So seven kids, seven kids, and your campus minister. It seems. I, 
you know, we talk a lot about temperaments on our show and, and the different <laughs> types of temperaments. I definitely, I've been told I fall in the whole melancholic side of things. I can't understand. I mean, we have five kids, by the way. I, I, I just can't even comprehend having kids and then wanting to go be around young adults all the time. I, that, that takes a special kind of personality. How did you, how in the world did you end up going down the route of the diaconate and having a lot of kids and then going into campus ministry all, it seems like all at the same time. What was that path? Well, for you? Yeah, it's um, you're right about that. I mean, sometimes I'm I'm an introvert at heart, and uh, I'm I'm not. I have a little bit of melancholic tendencies as well. You know, in the whole temperament thing, I'm I, not to toot my own horn, but I'm, I'm fairly balanced, mm. um, which I'm choosing to view as a positive uh, rather than. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first thought was that that must be so uh, nice to be in balance. That must be so nice. I know. I'm, a ba- balance is a better word than beige, but uh, you know. but I do have some melancholic tendencies, and I am an introvert. And being around young adults all day, and uh, you know, in my work as campus minister, um, you know, sometimes I do come home very exhausted and and then my kids are all buzzing around and they want to tell me about their days and, and all of this and that and it's like i just need like an hour of quiet mm. you know and that's mm. that's hard to find when i got involved in campus ministry though it was um 16 years ago mm. i'm starting my 16th year um at this school and my kids were much younger then and i had fewer of them mm. then mm. Uh, my wife and i had four children at the time and they were all very young um i think age like six and, and younger. Uh, and that has different stresses on yeah, it. I mean, yeah. and you guys know, because your children, um, you know, are, are older than they used to be as most people's children are older than they used to be. <laughs> 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 but, you know, number, uh, we, we had our first four kids in pretty quick succession and just dealing with a, a lot of young children at once is, is a different challenge. I'm glad we started when we were in our twenties and mm-hmm. had more stamina and energy than we do now. Uh, having our, our younger kids, our older kids were much older, much more able to, to help out. They were more independent. Um, and by then, of course, I was a little bit more stable in my job. Hmm. One of the things that's been a real blessing to me is for the longest time working with, you know, college students age 18 to, you know, 22, 23, 24, some of them, you know, and then my kids were much, much younger. Well, now I have children that are that age, right? Hmm. I have my, my oldest is a college graduate. You know, yeah. she's, she's a grown up. She's got rent and a job and, you know, a car payment and things, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I have I have two that are in college, you know, now one at Belmont Abbey uh, College in uh, here, in North Carolina. Another one is uh, at our local community college, learning how to be a welder. Mm. You know, he wants going to the trades. And, uh, you know, so now I have children that are the same age as the people that I minister to. And, you know, that my experience ministering to people in this transitional stage of life, I think has set me up to relate better to my children now that they're in this stage of life, because I've seen some of the pitfalls and things, but then also having kids in this stage of life brings a greater um, uh, empathy, I think, to my students and to my students' parents because now I know from firsthand experience kind of what they're going through, uh, especially parents whose kids are going to college for the first time in this transitional stage in mom and dad's life, you know, as well. So uh, they, they really influenced each other. Were you a campus minister before you were a deacon or were you a deacon before you became a campus minister? I was a campus minister before I was a deacon. I uh, started working in campus ministry in 2008, okay. and I was not ordained until 2018. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, I actually uh, first started to discern the call to the diaconate in 2004. Hmm. Um, I, I remember the day because it was uh, two days after Pope Benedict XVI was elected hmm. uh, Pope. Hmm. And, uh, you know, when the, the the, the, the guy comes out in the uh, St. Peter's on the balcony there, and he says, Abamus Papam, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I was at the time a part of a, a team of catechists teaching our CIA in our parish. Mm. And there were three of us. It was, it was our pastor and then, and then myself and another layman. And we kind of rotated responsibility to, to teach. And our pastor always got the 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 session on holy orders because hmm. you know he had them so we, we he taught the session on holy orders and so it was the the thursday after that 
and we were at our RCIA class and he was teaching on holy orders and he kind of went through what he normally did about priests, deacons, bishops. And then in the Q and A, you know, time after his presentation, one of the women in the, who was entering into the church said, well, I was watching TV this past you know, week when they elected the Pope and this guy came out in the balcony and, and on the screen, it said he was the Cardinal proto deacon. What is that? You know, <laughs> and, and I, I don't even remember what our pastor said, but that opened up an opportunity for him to talk about what a deacon is in a lot more depth than he ever had before. Mm -hmm. And it was really, even though I've, I've you know, I've, I've read the catechism, you know, I, I knew what a deacon was. It was almost like I was hearing it for the first time and something entered into my heart mm. in the listening to that, mm. that said, this could be you. Mm. Like, this is a possibility for for you. And I, I almost got, it's like a burning sensation, you know, like on the road to Emmaus and the apostle said, our hearts were burning within us. That's what it felt like. And that burning didn't go away until I talked to my wife about it. Mm. And I talked to our pastor about it. And then I made a phone call to the director of the diaconate formation program for our diocese to get information about next steps. And, and then things kind of subsided. Um, at the time, I was too young to enter into the formation process. Uh, when That was, like I said, 2004. Um, when I did reach the age to where I could apply, that was 2008. And that was the same year that I began my job in campus ministry. Mm. And as I mentioned, all of our, our four kids at the time were all very young, most of them still in diapers. And the formation team and their wisdom said, look, you just started a new job. Mm. Your, your kids are all really young. Your wife needs you. We don't want the demands of formation to put uh, an unreasonable stress on your family situation, you know, try us again later. And, and it was frustrating, but also relieving at the same time, because my wife and I had the same concerns yeah. about the demand formation. Uh, and so uh, I said, you know, if this is a call that God is really, you know, laying on me, it's not going to come with an expiration date. That call will still be there later on down the, the road. So mm. I, and, and I looked at my work in campus ministry as a beautiful opportunity for me to serve the church as a layman. Yeah. Um, because one thing that I had to discern was that, you know, am I seeking this out? Am I seeking out diaconal ordination because I think I need that grace to serve the church? Or is this something God's really calling me to do? And so I, I had a good solid 10 years of working as a lay minister in the Catholic Church, a professional lay minister full time. Um, before ordination, so that I knew I, I could do this job as a layman. It's not about work promotion. You yeah, know, I'm not yeah. trying to climb the, the ministerial ladder in the, in the church. You know, this isn't about job security or anything like that. I was happy to do the job as a layman. This is this is a call that goes, you know, a little bit deeper. And of course, my, my ministerial work has been blessed by the graces of ordination. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I worked as a layman for, for 10 years before yeah. I was ordained. I'm wondering how then, or at what point then, did St. Francis de Sales, in this book that you've written, The Devout Life, at some point his work, The Introduction to the Devout Life, came into your life and had to yes. have touched you deeply to a point that you wanted to write a book about it. Was So again, I keep asking, you know, what came first, the the Francis or the egg, right? <laughs> what came first? <laughs> you know, was, it, was it marriage? Was it your own pathway towards the diaconate? Was it campus ministry? When did Francis de Sales become a part of your life to the point that you wanted to do a work as substantial as what you put together in this new book? Yeah, much later on, uh, after all of that, after ordination, actually. It's so, <clears throat> you know, my whole path of, you know, being hired by the church to work in campus ministry. And then later on, I was uh, I picked up some additional duties in the education vicariate in our in our diocese. Um, you know, and I volunteered at our parish teaching RCIA. Um, I, uh, I taught some classes in our diocesan lay ministry program. And so I had my hand in a lot of different, you know, things. And an introduction to the devout life, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those spiritual classics. Yeah. So you can't be a, uh, uh, an active, well-informed Catholic and at least not have heard of it. It's like the Imitation of Christ or the Diary of a Soul. It's one of these spiritual classics that everyone knows, like, yeah, I should probably get around to reading that sometime. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was first inspired to actually, 
you know, purchase the book and, and open it up and read it. Um, it was at a, an educational conference that our, uh, our diocese uh, was putting on. And we had brought in a speaker from outside the diocese. He was um, uh, responsible for doing catechist training uh, and lay ministry formation in, in his diocese. And one of the things he mentioned to me was that he used the introduction to the devout life as the primary text for forming and training his catechists. Interesting. And, and yeah, I thought that was interesting. Now, I had not read the book at that time, but the way he described it, you know, short, little easy to read chapters, it deals directly with what it means to to live out um, uh, the life of discipleship. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, life of personal holiness, but it's written for lay people. And so he says, you know, let's, that's the best book he's found to use. And I said, well, I got to check it out, yeah. you know? So I ordered a copy and I started to read through it and, you know, and it is all of those things, but I, I immediately started asking myself, well, how can I, how can I utilize this in the formation of catechists and in the formation of my college students? Because we do a lot of leadership development with my um, with, with our, our students. I don't have a staff in campus ministry. I'm kind of a lone wolf, you mm. know, on our campus. So I rely heavily on my, my students to take on leadership roles. And so I do a lot of leadership development with them. How can I use this book, you know, for that? So I started looking online. I said, somebody's got to have study guides, questions, a curriculum based around this. And I'm sure someone does, right? But I couldn't find anything that I really liked. So I kind of put that yeah. idea on hold for a little bit. Now, at some point, I think around 2019, um, my wife and I, um, we had been in the habit at the time of doing evening prayer together after mm. we put the kids to bed, because mm. it's the only time when our house is quiet. And uh, and then after evening prayer, we would read a devotional, some book. We would read some book uh, as a devotional and then have a discussion around it. We We found that to be really fruitful for our marriage to have that time of prayer and then kind of honest discussion. Um, so uh, we had just finished up, um, I think it was actually a book on the temperaments. We were talking about the temperaments a little while ago. Yeah, sure. I think it was the temperament God gave your spouse or something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we had just finished up uh, one book and we were looking for another. And so I said, let's revisit an introduction to the devout life. Um, so we began to read that together. And, and again, it's perfectly suited for devotional reading because the chapters are so short. But St. Francis lived, you know, 400 years ago. And the situation that he is writing into was 400 years in, in the past. Now, a lot of what he's talking about in terms of virtue and prayer and the, the temptations that exist you know, in the world, that's perennial. Um, but the situation and the examples that he's using, you know, they don't always apply necessarily to our modern um, experience. Yeah. And so as we're reading this book together, a lot of our conversation around it um, ended up being me giving it a, a modern day explication of what St. Francis is talking about um, to my wife. And, and this is not and I'm always very clear about this. My wife is not an ignorant person. She's very well read. She's very smart. You know, so this is no slight on her. But because of my work in ministry and my work in forming um, other people in in how to be more active, more intentional Catholics, like I knew what St. Francis was talking about. Right? And I was able to incorporate that in with our modern day church situation. And so we're, we're about halfway through the book doing this. And my wife looks at me and she says, you, you need to write this down. Mm -hmm. Like there needs to be a modern version of this that uh, does for people what you're doing right now, that puts it into a modern context. Cause there's so much wisdom in an introduction to the devout life. And you wonder how many people just, number one, they're not picking it up yeah. because they're not particularly interested in reading a 400 year old Book well, by some French bishop, and it keeps referring to Philothea, and it's like, who, well, who's Philothea? It's like, you know, what, what am I? I'm not Philothea. Yeah. Who's he talking to? I feel like I'm reading private letters to someone, and you know, it's it's a little, it is a little different. When, when you were putting this together, and I'm asking this, um, Deacon, just a little bit from a a personal curiosity uh, and selfish perspective, because there's a a book, a classic book that I've been working through the last couple of years 
with the intent of doing something very similar to what you've done with the devout life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious of your process <clears throat> because it's what, what you've done hasn't replaced St. Francis de Sales work. And in fact, no. I would say that people still need to read his work and your work kind of side by side. How did, what was your process in like what stays in from what he wrote? What needs to be replaced how did you do it so that it's not just a one to one translation for the you know or a, a modernization for for our current time? What what was your process for putting the book together? I'm really curious uh, how, of the difficulty of that of taking this work where it's like don't screw this up right this is like such a classic work don't take it and like water it down um, yeah and 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 don't try to replace it. If there's a balance that you had to have been trying to juggle while you were doing this. Oh, for sure. And you need a huge dose of humility to do it, yeah, too. Right? Because it's like, and, and I was really hesitant to even start because right. there's that sense of who am I to think I can update a saint <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. or improve upon, <laughs> you know, a saint. And, you know, and there's always that justification. Well, this is a good if, start, Francis. It's a good start. It's a good start. But let me <laughs> let let me finish it for you now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, 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 you know, and if an introduction to the devout life is so good, why not just tell people to read it themselves? <laughs> you know, and why, why, do, why is the need for this? So I really owe my wife's encouragement to, mm. to that. Yeah. Um, so my, as I wouldn't have written this unless mm. she was very clear that, no, you really, you know, I really want you to do this. Um, yeah. So you begin with a big dose of humility and you realize that, Number one, what I want to contain in this in this book, I, I want this to be Saint Francis's wisdom. I mean, really, I want this to be God's holy wisdom. Yeah. But but i you know I, I I believe I'm of the opinion, countless others are that Saint Francis taught God's holy wisdom in his introduction to the devout life. I mean, there's a reason it's still around 400 years later. So I want to honor that and make sure that I'm not giving my advice. Mm. I'm not. I'm not doing Deacon Matt's wisdom. If you're seeking Deacon Matt's wisdom, God help you. You know. Um, so I want to teach what Saint Francis taught. I view myself as a translator, not in sense of language, but a translator in sense of culture and context. I want to take his wisdom and I want to bring it into our modern day church, and I want to also update it only in the sense of. In the past 400 years, we've had other ecumenical councils. Mm. We've had other saints, right? We have the the wisdom of Pope John Paul II. Um, we've we've got the uh, reforms in the liturgy, right? So a lot of what he says about about the liturgy, um, you you've got to ask, okay, well, how does this apply to most Catholics' experience of the liturgy, you know, today? And so I want to translate it in terms of how does this apply to our modern situation? And then also, how do the, the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, um, what we find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, how does that map onto you know, what St. Francis de Sales is teaching? Mm. And what I discovered was it maps onto it very easily <laughs> because there's nothing in what he wrote that doesn't go hand in glove with what you'll find in the Catechism. Um, but but that was part of my, uh, that was certainly part of my approach. Um, so after reading through the book, you know, with my wife, and and I actually made sure that I wanted to read it in a couple of different translations, mm. uh, because different translations certainly make a difference. So I've, I've got a bunch of copies on my shelf, all these <laughs> different translations and editions. Um, I, I went through it with fresh eyes, um, uh, chapter by chapter, um, and I, I followed his outline. Uh, I followed his trajectory. And I said, how would I have, after having read this chapter or sometimes um, just for the sake of organization, I, I combined, you know, a few chapters, you know, together, how would I explain this as if I'm explaining it to one of my college students yeah. or someone <clears throat> at my parish who, who comes to me and says, you know, Deacon Matt, you know, I'm, I'm reading my way through this book and I'm having a hard time understanding X, Y, Z. Help me to understand. Um, I think that's one of the charisms that that God has given to me um, to uh, to help people understand um, sometimes 
complex spiritual realities, uh, but to put it in, in simple, more direct terms. And so I just applied those same gifts that I would if I were in conversation with someone one-on-one, but but putting it down on paper. Hmm. When oh, go ahead. Well, I did have a question, especially since you um, are around so many students, and undoubtedly they are all in different parts of their own faith journey. Is mm-hmm. the introduction to the devout life for everyone, regardless of where you are on that journey, or do you kind of need to be pretty committed and pretty into this journey towards mm-hmm. God? Well, I I wouldn't say it's for everyone. Right. And, and I say that because I think a resource for everyone is, is going to be pretty bland. <laughs> um, I, when I was writing it, um, I assumed an audience that was already, already a, a committed Catholic, committed in the sense that, you know, they, they identify as a Catholic. They take their faith somewhat seriously. Um, they, they attend Mass, uh, but they're looking for that next step. OK, I'm, I'm ready to engage in my faith a little bit beyond just going to mass on Sundays, you know, uh, listening to a couple of Catholic podcasts or something. You know, I, yeah. I want to I, I hear a lot about discipleship, you know, and I want to know what does that look like lived out in my life today? I'm not going to join a monastery. You know, I'm, I'm I'm a husband with a job and a family or, you know, I'm a stay at home mom or I'm a single woman, you know, out in the world or I'm, you know, I think it's for any anyone of uh, of an adult age, high school, college student, certainly older. Um, but they want that next step. I want to take my faith seriously. So I would say it's not necessarily for the person who's seeking right? Who's wondering, do I even believe in God? Um, You know, do I even want to be Catholic, you know, anymore? There are other great books that would address those situations, you know, more directly. This is for someone who says, okay, I'm Catholic, you know, and and I'm all, I'm all for that. But what's, what's the next step? Mm. How do I really grow in virtue? How do I, how do I pray? How do I pray? Right. I try and pray. I go home. I say my rosary. Am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, uh, I, I want to do something more than bless my meals. I, I feel like there's got to be more in my prayer life than that. But no one's ever sat down and said, this mm. is how you pray. You know, well, St. Francis has a beautiful method of daily mental prayer. And, and he walks you through it step by step. And so I, I walk through that with you step by step. There's some wonderful meditations in here to, to get you started with that. Same thing about virtue, right? How do I grow in virtue? We we hear about virtue, but but what's the nitty gritty of it? You know, in my in my life at work, in my life at school, in my life at home, how do I put virtue into practice? Well, Saint Francis is very practical about that. So that's who this book is for, right? That Catholic that wants to take that next step in their faith and and really live that life of discipleship. Yeah, as I was now, <clears throat> you know, Jennifer was asking, and and I think in relation to the original St. Francis de Sales book with your mm-hmm. book, the devout life, w- would you give the same answer that it's, it's for that person who's already in that place that you just described or what? Or the same it, answer is, yeah, yeah. yeah because the of, person, of who the person that St. Francis was writing to. So for those who might not know, right, what is an introduction to the devout life? It's a collection. It, it was written as if it were a collection of letters to one of St. Francis's spiritual directees. Okay. One of his, one of his great gifts is, as a spiritual director. And um, we, uh, we're we pretty sure that the person he had in mind, you mentioned Philothea a little while ago, yeah. like, who, who is yeah. this person, right? <laughs> Was the um, the wife of, if I remember right, the wife of a cousin of his who was a member of the French nobility, or maybe the there was some relation there. Um, but, but he didn't want to, he didn't want this to be for a specific person. So he generalized it with the name Philothea, right? Mm-hmm. One who loves... Uh, one who loves God. Mm. So you have someone who is already Catholic, Christian, committed, but they're seeking direction in their life, um, not as a not as a nun, you know, not as a as a novice or a postulant or anything like that, but just as a uh, you know a noble woman living in the in the courts. How can I be holy out here in the courts? And so his um, his beginning premise is that everyone is called to be holy. Everyone is called to live a life of devotion. You don't have to be a member of the professional religious class, you know. Um, you can be uh, a holy wife and mother, husband and father, noble woman, 
um, mechanic, farmer, soldier, wherever you are in, in life, God is calling you to be holy there. And so if you really understand what true devotion to God is, whatever your your small V vocation is, whatever your state in life is, that's going to be made easier and sweeter by the devotion that you have to God. So, you know, in, in that he was 400 years ahead of the Second Vatican Council's universal call to holiness. So that's where he begins. And so his advice is really written for that lay person yeah. in the world. It doesn't assume any specialized religious knowledge, but it does assume at least that you are a believing Christian who wants to be more devout. That that's where you start. I, I you know, I'm kind of reading into what where my wife's question may have come from, and then my my own follow up. When I was reading it, so one of our one of our young adult sons um, is somewhat fallen away. He hasn't flat out, you know, rebuked the faith. He just he never really had that deep encounter with Jesus Christ, and and well, that he could interpret that, or that, recognize, or, yeah, or that he yeah. saw right. Yeah. It's like, and yeah, if you sure. if you had that encounter with Christ, you, you you know that was an encounter with Christ, and it it always kind of perplexed us as parents. Not that he was doing anything wrong on his own. He was going to mass. He would join us with the, for the rosary. He was doing the steps. He was doing what he was told. But there has been this <laughs> perpetual dryness throughout his life, and he hasn't had that relationship. We'd send him on retreats with the youth group and all those kinds of things. And so that was in our minds. And as I was going through your book, I'm just like, you know, the desire of a parent, you wish that they could have this methodical walk through and then Jesus is going to show up at the end. And, and and that may or may not be the case. And so I think that's part of the questions. But I think I think let's back up because you started to go down another path that I think is necessary in talking about your book. And again, it's called The Devout Life, A Modern Guide to Practical Holiness with St. Francis de Sales. The idea of, of devotion, I found it really interesting that at the beginning of the book, you, you, you said we have to have an understanding of vocabulary. What is devotion in the first place? What are we talking about? Because when he said The Devout Life... I might be a devout Star Wars fan. You know, I'm going to go see every Star Wars movie, no matter how bad it is. That's how devoted I am to this, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about just like love has different uh, meanings in Greek. I, I, I want to make sure that we, when we say the devout life, when we're talking about that, we understand what it is that we mean. And one of the things that you point out in the book, and, and quoting to sales, that there's many counterfeits, but only one true devotion. So what did he mean by that? What is that only true devotion uh, that 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 we have to be focused on as we begin this journey? Because I think that goes back to who this book is for at the same time. Yeah, it's it's love of God, you know, in, in no more, no less. And and I don't say that in a dismissive way, because in some sense, that's an easy answer, right? Sure. Love God. Yeah. Yeah. We all know we're supposed to love God, right? But what St. Francis shows us, not just in the introduction, but throughout the whole book is that 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 love of God demands a lot because it's love, because love demands a lot. Mm. Um, and you mentioned being devoted to, to Star Wars, you know, and, and going to see every single movie, no matter how bad it is. And, you know, I don't know, collecting the figures and you got Star Wars art hanging up all over. And, no, I'm not that like, bad. I'm, a Star I'm not that Wars, bad. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm, I would describe myself as a Star Wars fan in the sense mm. that, yeah, I've seen the movies. Yeah. I enjoy it. I have a good time going to see that. But I can't, I can't name all the characters. I can't, you know, I, I, I can't get engaged in these detailed conversations. I don't have Star Wars, you know, art up or anything like that, right? So I'm not a devoted Star mm. Wars fan. Mm. And, and that's, that's the difference because devotion is where, I think the way that I put it in the first chapter is devotion is where um, love meets enthusiasm. And so it's not just, you know, um, it doesn't just operate out of a sense of obligation. Right? I'm, I'm going to Mass because the Church says I have an obligation to go to Mass on Sunday, or I'm praying the Rosary because I got enrolled in the Brown Scapular, and, you know, I'm, I'm checking off the boxes, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or, or even there can be one of the things St. Francis warns against is equating devotion with um, exterior signs of devotion. You know, we look at somebody in the Church and say, oh, this— you know, this this young woman is, you know, looks really devout. She she shows up the mass early. She's wearing a veil. She's always, you know, kneeling, you know, and, and praying her rosary before mass begins to prepare for mass. Like, I, I want to be devout, so I want to do that too, right? So you buy a veil and you start to veil. And well, not me, I'm not going to start to veil, but, you know, uh, 
but you, Jennifer, maybe you, you buy a, a veil and you start the veil and you get to mass early so you can pray the rosary and you kneel down just like she's kneeling down. And there can be a danger in equating those exterior signs with true devotion and saying, well, because now I'm doing these things, I'm devout, right? Um, or because I pray the liturgy of the hours and because I pray a daily rosary and because I do a, a, a holy hour every week and because I go to daily mass and, you know, you just check off the boxes because I do all these things, I'm devout. Well, doing all those things is good. It doesn't make you devout. Yeah. They can be aids in devotion, right? And, and they can be very helpful for people. And But the devout person is not doing those things because, well, I think I need to in order to be devout. Hmm. The devout okay. person is doing those things because they love God. Okay, thoughts. I have thoughts, too, thoughts. by the way. Okay. I have, have lots thoughts. Of Go for it. Would you say you're a devout Catholic deacon? Like, can you just claim that? <laughs> can I claim it? <laughs> Should you? Do you? However you want to yeah. lead into that. Yeah, well, you know, the um, humility uh, would, you know, my sense of humility would make me inclined to say, well, no, don't claim to be devout. But then also... Talking about your own sense of humility is not a real humble thing to do. <laughs> I know. This is like, so, how do you win? You know, so humility and and, and St. Francis actually talks about this. There's a chapter on humility where he says one of the tricky things about humility is it's kind of a shy virtue. It's really hard to work on humility because as soon as you start working on humility and you start thinking about am I humble or you know how humble I like you you, you cease becoming humble. So yeah, yeah. you know. Um, I, I would say, with that qualifier, <laughs> I would say I am striving to okay. be a devout yeah. Catholic deacon, but to the extent to which I am devout has nothing to do with my, my external practices of prayer. I'll give you an example. Okay, our youngest son is not quite two. All right. So there's there's a gap between him and my next youngest of eight years. Okay. So for eight years, so, so for eight years, we, we didn't have any kids and um, or new young kids. Right. Mm. So my my youngest son was, you know, old enough that he wasn't waking up crying in the morning. Uh, you know, he was he could make himself, you know, cereal for breakfast or whatever. They're more independent. And so I had fallen into what for me was a really useful, really helpful um, rhythm in my prayer life, where I, I kind of mentioned a little while ago, my wife and I have in the habit of praying together in the evening after the kids go to bed. Well, the morning was my time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an early riser. Most of the rest of my family is not. So I knew that I could get up uh, around five or six in the morning, and I'd have a couple of hours of just solid, quiet, time and i would pray my my breviary i would pray a rosary i would do lexio divina i would do just some some mental prayer for all of my different intentions i would be able to reflect on my coming day right all the, the any meetings any appointments that i had um, and and i would pray for those people that i'd be meeting with and and i had my own little setup right so i had icons and i had um, my bible next to me and i had a little incense burner and i would burn incense and it would smell like i was at church and if you had talked to me about deacon matt how's your prayer life right I would have said, my prayer life is better than it's ever been. And man, everybody should have a prayer life like mine because I figured it out, you know? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> now along comes our, our baby boy, Ephraim. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we were not planning on being blessed with a child at this stage in our life. You know, uh, we, had, we had already started to send our oldest ones out off to college. And, you know, so we were, my wife and I were mentally settling in to this, this, stage of being parents of older kids. God said, nope, I've got another plan for you. So he sends us another little boy. And, um, well, I'll just say my mornings don't go quite the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so as, as, a, as an ordained deacon, I am bound by church law to, to pray my liturgy of the hours, uh, specifically morning prayer and evening prayer. And I, and I do that 
And I still do, uh, I try and do a little Lexio Divina at minimum. I'll, I'll at least read the day's, you know, gospel, you know, reading. Um, I, I will not say that it is subjectively the same prayerful experience that I was getting before. You know, mm -hmm. it's normally done in the living room more often than not with a baby on my lap, trying to pull up the ribbons and asking for, for juice or whatever, you know, um, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that makes me any less devout. And probably if, if I were going to pretend to be my own spiritual director and imagine what my mm -hmm. spiritual director would tell me, the fact that I am persisting in that prayer, not out of a sense of obligation, although there is an obligation there, right? Yeah. And that sense of obligation mm -hmm. is good and that it's keeping me from giving up. But I genuinely love that prayer time. And I know that God is there in that prayer time and that God knows that I'm not doing this now because of any subjective prayerful experience that it's giving me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm doing it because I love God and, and I'm honoring those obligations to pray because I love God. And that then when I put my breviary down and I go change my kid's diaper or, you know, make him his breakfast, that that's also an act of love and service. And as long as I'm doing that with an eye towards loving God, uh, that I'm doing these things, I'm engaging in my vocation as a husband and a father um, out of out of a love for God and who's put me in this vocation, then that's also an act of <laughs> prayer. And, and I think that's key to advancing in the devout life. It's not so much about doing anything different in your day-to-day -day vocation according to your state in life but but doing what you're doing for the love of god and and learning to bring god with you into those moments it's it's not complicated you know and that's what's beautiful about kind of this method of, of growing in devotion that saint francis lays out it is imminently doable anyone can do this but you have to be led. You have to have an intentionality behind it. You have to be informed. Like this is this is what it means, you know. A, a minute ago, you <clears throat> used that phrase, and I, and I actually typed it up. I, I really like the line that you said: "Devotion is where love meets enthusiasm." Yeah. But also in the book, you write that <clears throat> the goal of the devout life is perfect love. Right? Christ mm -hmm. is telling us to be. I mean, he says, you know, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And we, the name of our show is Adventures in Imperfect Living because we're not there yet. We're trying really hard to get there. But I, I love the fact that you you drew this correlation because I so many thoughts going through my mind, right? When you're talking about saying the daily liturgy of the hours and the rosary and doing all those other things, I do those things too. But the more that I do them, the the less devout I feel, the more weak I feel because I because I you know it's a mag these things are magnifying glasses back on the way that we need to be growing in holiness that we see all the gaps all of the all of the areas that we're missing um, to be more like Christ and what you write about in this book the devout life Christ telling us to be perfect lovers you know not just in the conjugal sense not perfect athletes, not perfect painters, not perfect whatever, but perfect lovers, perfect lovers of mankind, perfect lovers of other people. And again, going back to what I just said a second ago, man, I'm so far away from that. It's like the more, the deeper I go, the, the, the worse I feel about how I'm doing in that. But how does DeSales and then how in your, your book, which is like an introduction to the introduction, right? I mean, that's the way I kept looking at that is your book is an introduction to the introduction to the devout life. That's a great companion piece. How would DeSales and how would you, Deacon Matt, propose that we rectify those imperfections? How does this book, because that's what it is, this book should be rect helping us to rectify our imperfections so that we can have a greater level of perfection. So so that's part one, right? Let me use that as a um, jumping off point to talking about the format of, of how you formatted your book. Uh, I know you have chicken and sheep at your house. You, know, you take care of those kids. Um I was trying to draw a correlation between that um, farmer-like existence that you have uh, and then the gardening analogies of how you separate the content in this book, right? For part one, you have preparing the soil. Then you talk about planting the seeds and growing in virtue, weeding out temptation, renewing the soil. Does, does DeSales, and it's been about 20 years since I actually read the original, does DeSales use that same 
type of imagery, or is that is that a way of making it more modern and bring all those things together as the strive for perfection? Yeah, he doesn't use that precise imagery, which is a little bit surprising because he loves using agricultural imagery, you know, in, in his writing. You know, most of the people uh, in, in at the time when he was writing this book 400 years ago, you know, were farmers. And so he does use a lot of agricultural imagery, um, mm -hmm. but he doesn't use that particular um, uh, parable of the sower uh, that I do to describe the um, the format of his book. Now, the five sections of my book mirror the five sections of the original. So mm -hmm. I haven't changed anything in that regard. But as I was making a study of his book, it just occurred to me because I love the parable of the sower. Yeah. It's yeah. occurred to me that the content of his five sections maps perfectly onto the uh, the parable of the sower. So the, the first section is really about, like you said, um, tilling up the soil, right? Uh, it, for, for those who might not be familiar with the parable of the sower uh, is, a, is one of my favorite parables because it's one that Jesus actually explains to us what it means. He doesn't leave us wondering. Yeah, you know? right. So, so God is the sower and he kind of spreads his seed indiscriminately. And whether or not that seed bears fruit depends upon the quality of the soil in which the seed falls, right? So we are the soil and we want to make sure that our hearts are are prepared to receive god's grace right yeah. we want to prepare the soil of our hearts so the first section of this book is about tilling the soil if you've ever had a garden you gotta you gotta break up the soil you gotta make it soft you gotta get rid of any rocks and or whatever that's in there and so the first part of this book is leading us towards that interior gaze taking a real a, a real objective look at your life and a lot of times when people do that, your, your experience, Greg, um, yeah, I, I, I see this so often in people, especially people who are starting to take their faith seriously for the first time. And, and I know that's not the case with you, but I do see it a lot with people who are starting to take their faith seriously um, and, and they look at their lives and they say, man, I'm not there, you know, yeah. and, and there can even be... Um, uh, a sense of scandal because some people there, if their expectation is, well, I'm I'm praying more, I'm going to confession more often, I'm being more intentional about being a virtuous person, um, you know, I, I I'm doing all the things that should make me feel closer to God. Why do I feel farther away? Why do I feel more more sinful? Um, and one possible reason for that subjective feeling is because, well. You were actually this way before. It just didn't bother you as much because you didn't realize it, right? Yeah. Like yeah. now, I use the analogy of you know driving uh, driving your car down the highway, and you're, you're looking through the windshield windscreen of your car, and it looks clean, it looks clear, you know. But now you you turn the corner, and now the sun's right in front of you. And as soon as the light from the sun hits your 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 windshield, you see every little dead bug and smear and, you know, crack and all of that. And you're like, oh, my window's filthy, you know? And well, it was always filthy. You just didn't see it until you, the light of the sun shone, you know, on it. So it's like, well, now you're, you're subjecting yourself to the light, God's perfect light. And so, yeah, God's going to show you all these places where you need to grow. The trick is, you know, to not condemn yourself over it because despite your mm -hmm. sinfulness despite your imperfection mm -hmm. god loves you he loves you more than you love yourself and he's calling you to something greater and and that's where the rubber hits the road mm -hmm. of growing in in virtue i i had a young man who um came through our campus ministry program um for our cia he actually wasn't even a student at this university but he was a college age um, young man, and he saw that we offered RCIA uh, for college students. So he came to see me, and uh, he uh, had been active in a pagan local pagan temple. Mm. Uh, so it was. I kind of felt like I was doing RCIA in the second century. You know, mm. he was uh, he was a bona fide pagan, uh, but he he wanted to check out the Catholic Church, and I, it was a beautiful RCIA experience because it was just one on one he and I because of his schedule and. Uh, there was at one point when we were meeting and he was he was really struggling with with this aspect of virtue right G 
growing, being a better person, living a life of virtue. And he was sharing with me some of his struggles and, you know, I was really feeling for him. But he told me at the end of that conversation that even though this was really hard and he was really struggling, this was just reaffirming for him that he was exactly where he wanted to be. He said, Deacon Matt, in, when I was in, involved in that pagan temple, he said, everybody there welcomed me. Everybody there um, you know, wanted me to be there. They said that I was welcome. And uh, he said, but no one challenged me to be better than I was. Mm -hmm. And he says, for the first time in my <laughs> life, I feel like that like I am being challenged to be a better person. And he says, that's exactly what I need. And he says, yeah, it's hard, but I'm, I'm not going anywhere, you know? Uh, and so he, he stuck it out. And, uh, you know, and I'll always remember that conversation because I thought that's, that, that, that's so beautiful. We all need to be challenged to be a better person. Somebody, I can't remember who um, said that, you know, God loves you just the way you are, mm. but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. You know, he's calling you to, to greatness. And so, you know, for me, I guess to go, to go back and answer your question, the, that, that sense of imperfection that you feel, you, you kind of have to embrace that. That's what living a life of devotion, you know, is all about. That's where it starts. You, perfection is not a prerequisite for being a Christian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In fact, it's almost the obvious, you know, uh, or the opposite, rather. It's almost the opposite. You have to begin by recognizing, I am not perfect. I do not know how to love perfectly. I do not know how to pray perfectly. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, but, but yet, despite that, God loves me enough to call me to perfection, and that this life that he has given me is meant to be a school of perfection, a school of holiness, a school of devotion. And if, if you have eyes open to see it, right, everything about your life, even the hardships and the challenges, especially the hardships and the challenges, are opportunities to grow in holiness, mm -hmm. to grow in that devotion. Maybe, maybe it's to grow in patience. Maybe it's to grow in love. Maybe it's to grow in humility. But there's some... There is some lesson that God has to teach you in every single circumstance, you know, of your life. Um, and you don't always know what it is. Yeah. But to have faith in God as a loving father who is guiding you tells you, okay, Lord, there's there's some there's something you have for me here. And I just have to be patient and trust in you and, and some good will come, you know, from this. Um it can be hard to see that in the moment, but living this life of devotion helps you. It, 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 it primes you to see your challenges in life through that lens, I think. So beautiful. one thing I noticed in, in the outline, the table of contents, uh, the layout of the book, these gardening analogies that you didn't really have the harvest as a part of that because the harvest – I think is for God. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. Yeah, it's like you had all of the preparing of the fields and planting the seeds and things start growing, but yeah. there was a lack of harvest, but I'm curious. Uh, that comes to the end. <laughs> what, yeah. Well, what, what's, you know, for Deacon Matt thinking about this book, the devout life, um, you've made a modern guide to practical holiness with St. Francis de Sales. Five years from now, what kind of fruit, would you love the Holy Spirit to bring from this book? I mean, I would say I have the same aspirations that St. Francis de Sales had for um, for the original work was is just that it brings people closer to God. You know, um, if it bring if if I have one or two people come up to me and say or email me and say, you know, I thank you for writing this book. It it really helped me to be a better Christian, or it's really helped me to um, be more intentional about my practice of the Catholic faith. Um, you know, it'll be worth me putting in the effort to write it. I, I hope it helps many more than just one or two people, but that's, that's truly my only aspiration is, is I hope it helps people. I love the fact that the, you know, you propose several different ways that could be an individual devotional. It can be done with study groups, prayer groups, that kind of thing. You talked about you and your wife, um, going through the original together I, you know, this is one of the, these books that as I was going through it and having um, struggled in the good ways of getting through the original, uh, 
I'm, I was really happy when Sophia offered this book to us and asked if you know we want to take a look at it. And I was like, yeah, because it's one of those books uh, that sales this book is one that I keep taking off the shelf every year or two and go, I need to go through this again. I need to go through it again. I need to go. And I feel like your book was sort of like the, uh, the butt kicker that I needed to, to actually get back into doing this again, because there's so many aspects of it. It's again, seeking that perfection. We need that. We need a guide. And this book, uh, really seems to be helping me to have something reawaken. So know that one of those two souls that you were looking for, I might be one of them. <laughs> That would be awesome. Oh, that's that's great. Um, and you you mentioned reading, you know, my book in tandem with uh, an introduction to the devout life. I think that'd be a beautiful thing to do uh, because I I do just follow along, you know, with it. There's not a there's not an exact one to one chapter, um, you know, replication because you know there are some some sections where what he might expound upon over three or four chapters I'll condense, you know, into yeah. one. Um, but I think you certainly can read an introduction to the devout life and then pick up my book and read those corresponding chapters as an aid to help you to understand. Um, but also, you know, you don't have to, and, and I want your listeners to be, to be aware. It's, it's not a study guide, you know, to an introduction mm -hmm. to the devout life. Like this, this works beautifully as a standalone um, work. So if, if, if that makes it a little bit more accessible, I did write it intentionally with an eye towards reading it as a daily devotional um, or possibly with a study group. So there are the chapters are all, you know, three or four pages, maybe five. I kept them intentionally short so that you could very easily read them in one sitting. Every chapter uh, concludes with discussion questions, which uh, most of those were written by my wife because I find it kind of difficult to come up with questions about my own work. <laughs> so <laughs> she would uh kind of our methodology is i would write the chapter and then i would read it out loud to her to make sure that it uh made sense orally as well as you know on the written page and then from there she would say okay well here's some questions that i have and so she would help me with those uh reflection questions uh and i always include a passage from scripture at the very end so that if you're doing this as part of your devotional reading or if you're doing this with a study group you can conclude with a brief time of prayer by meditating on that, that scripture verse. Uh, so it's it's a perfect mm -hmm. little book to keep by your side for, for daily devotional reading, or like I said, for group study. Well, I'm really glad uh, you and your wife stumbled into this <laughs> just quite <laughs> providentially as you're just having that couple time together. And by the way, I just, I find that very beautiful. It's a very marriage affirming moment that that is how you choose to spend your evenings together. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, I would. I I'll think pray for that, us that we can get back into it because, yeah, as I mentioned, we have a not quite two year old at home, so our <laughs> our evening routine's a little bit different than it used to be. <laughs> what would you like to read now? I mean, do you ever like banter around book ideas? Like, okay, it's time. We haven't read anything together in a while. Yeah, and my wife usually says, "You pick something." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you do that? You literally just read one chapter simultaneously. And then you finish, and then you discuss it like a little book club for her husband and wife? I, I, I read out loud, uh, oh, and she listens, okay. is how we've been doing it. I've, I've been reading out loud to my kids since, you know, my youngest was uh, old enough to sit in my lap and pay attention. So, you know, more than 20 years, I've been reading out loud to my kids every night. And so it was just kind of natural when we were finished doing evening prayer, I would pick up a book and read out loud to my wife. Oh, nice. <laughs> so. Even like my that. older kids still let me read out loud to them. It's great. The, the, <laughs> the books have changed, but uh, it, it's it's a nice part of our evening routine. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you for for hanging out with us. Thank you for the book. I, mean, there, I had a zillion other questions that, quite honestly, I think that they would have just been uh, repetitious for some of the other things that we we said. The book, the original book, made a huge difference in my life. So I hope people will pick up this one from you because I believe that it has the same potential. Uh, I, I see an uprising of this kind of thing, right? Father Edward Looney did some of this with uh, uh, different books, and you know, I see other authors taking the classics. It's like, that we need not a modernization, not a changing, but a reintroduction of these introductions to various aspects mm -hmm. of our faith. And for your next project, by the way, I mean, I think at the beginning of the book, you, you mentioned, and you said at the beginning of, the, of our conversation, you know, you, the story of a soul, uh, a few other books, the, the Interior Castle, these these others, those might be the next ones that you need to uh, 
to be revisiting again. Read it as, to your as, wife. Read it to your wife, <laughs> and then uh, and, and then and then see what kind of things come out in your uh, own meditations. And you might have your next book. You may have already given a preview of your next book in your own book right now. I'm just saying. Oh, I just, well, I, my wife and I have both on our own read an interior castle, and and I I don't know that I'm there yet. I, <laughs> I think I'm still out there with the alligators or where. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly right, right. out on the moat of that. <laughs> well, Deacon Matt, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you for being on the program, and thank you for this work that you've done with the devout life oh you're welcome it's been a it's been a great time so uh you're welcome to have me back anytime and have a good time yeah awesome. thanks i just said good time like three times in a That's row okay. it's a great time <laughs> so i forgot how to talk here at the end <laughs> now having never read the introduction to the devout life jennifer how do you feel now that we spoke with deacon matthew newsom what what it, because it's it's a tough it's a tough book and, well, and like you said, you've said, we got a zillion books on our bookshelf, yeah. and, and it's, it's like, what do I have to read? What should I read? Yeah. You know, it, it, what are you thinking about this? Has this ever been I, on your radar? It's it's only been on my radar in the sense of how he brought it up in, in the beginning of our conversation, as most people have at least heard of it, yeah. who are pretty committed to their Catholic faith. So I am definitely in that camp. I have seen the book on our shelf for years, our, for decades. <laughs> yeah. uh, I definitely feel a lot more encouraged to pick it up now and read it, but I will probably read his book yeah. uh, only because I know I can uh, benefit from the way Deacon Matt will just explain what St. Francis de Sales was saying. And that's really the heart of his book. It's an explanation, not a changing or modernization. It's just, I'm going to explain it to you in your vernacular, which is what I need. And then it's great having, obviously, the source material also in our bookshelf so we, that we could um, get the deeper dive if we want it. Uh, so I, I'm, I like I'm that, very if excited. we want it, right? And that's so it's key. It's a choice, yeah. And, and, and that was one of the things as I was going through it. I, I think that I'm a, an overly, I, I wouldn't say I'm overly scrupulous, but when it comes to books, like we, we mm-hmm. talk with our friends Mac and Catherine, and Catherine reads books like mm-hmm. mega fast, but I also know she skips pages sometimes. And I can't do it. I just there's something Shame in me. On you. There's yeah. something in me. I cannot do it. Yeah. And and what I liked as we were talking um with Deacon Matt was there there's no skipping of the of the the kernel of important nugget information that's in there. The kernel of important nugget of information. <sighs> that's a terrible phrase. What does that even mean? The the important stuff. The important he doesn't stuff. skip the important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The important stuff is is in the devout life. And I, you know, as someone who is constantly trying to figure out doing what he's, you know, he said he talked about having, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to take complex things and and to make them more approachable. I feel like that's what we've been doing for all these years of podcasting and radio and everything is is catechism class or other podcasts of taking complicated subjects and make it understandable. I, you know, hearing that, it's like, I, I need to take my own medicine. It's like what I give out to other people. It's like, I need to, I need to be able to receive it a little bit. I actually had the same thought earlier this morning as I was uh, preparing for the show. I was reading some of uh, Deacon Matt's explanation of St. Francis de Sales and thinking, I literally just said something like this to Lily this morning. I was telling her to do this kind of thing, and I realized I need to do what I am instructing her yep. to do. And how often do we as parents have that realization that we need to take our own medicine, that we need to drink our own medicine and and do it because we desire our child's good and their formation. We want to impart them tools on how to handle difficulties in life. And it makes a lot of sense when it's not happening to us that we suddenly are very wise and that we could instruct and guide. But when we're the ones going through pain, we get <laughs> flustered and we forget and we go, dear God, help me. I don't know what to do. We kind of do because we're telling our kids how to get through it. And I found myself realizing I need to do exactly what I told her to do this morning because it's good advice, because it's from God. And he knows how our hearts are wired and that we need him and we need to pray. And it doesn't matter if we feel it. You know, that came up a little bit in our conversation about maybe praying when it's hard and when we feel like it's dry and it's like, I'm just reading words right now in one eye and out the other. But you stay in it and you do it because that's where the battle is actually more fierce. And that's what I think spiritual fighting is all about. And it's a worthy fight. So if you want to find out uh, more about Deacon Matt, you can go to his blog, Test 
testeverythingblog.com is That's great. Is his website, testeverythingblog.com. Uh, the book is available from our friends over at Sophia Institute Press. We'll put links to all this in the show notes. And if you look down in uh, the the uh, comments or whatever, not the comments, the description, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then you'll see it all down there. And if you are watching it on YouTube, make sure that you're hitting that subscribe, like button, leaving some comments, all those things that will help tickle YouTube's algorithm and p- perhaps bring other people to discover the work that we're trying to do with Rosie Army and Adventures in Imperfect Living. Ticking, t- tickling yeah. the algorithm? You didn't like that? <laughs> that was weird. That was weird? Yeah. That was a little weird? A little weird. That was all my way of tickling <laughs> YouTube's algorithm. <laughs> that does sound wrong. <laughs> now that I'm saying it more than once, it's, yeah. it's, that's kind of gross. Don't tickle the algorithm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's I, it now. I, I need to stop saying it. I, I can't stop saying tickle the algorithm. <laughs> Just YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. No, thank you for being a part of our community. Uh, go over to Rosary Army to get some resources to help you grow in your faith. Uh, if you don't have a rosary, if you're not praying it every day, we want to help you out with that. You can either listen to our audio prayers online. You can get the app from Rosary Army on all, any place, any app stores that you use, uh, both for Apple as well as non-Apple mobile devices. Uh, the the app is available there. But you can also get a free rosary from Rosary Army. Just go to rosaryarmy.com, and we'll be happy to hook you up and pray your rosary every single day. That's what we always advise you to do. And do whatever it takes to be devout, reverent, and holy. And perfect. Um, and imperfect at the same time. And, and a good humble. parent. And a, a, a fast reader. A reader who reads the whole book. Talk to you in a few days. God bless, folks. Bye. Bye.